a single creature, whatever. For St. Thomas, this means that it's good to have creatures of various sorts, such as non-embodied intellectual creatures, like angels, and embodied intellectual creatures, like human beings, and embodied non-intellectual creatures, like plants and animals, and so on. Christians have thus argued that a creation which manifests a diversity of kinds of things, and perhaps a spectrum of increasingly better things, is befitting of a perfect and loving God. If along that spectrum we find organisms that are living, sentient, and corporeal, it will be good for those organisms to be capable of feeling pain as a mechanism for protecting their bodily integrity. As I noted above, it's crucial to this CD that there also be some justification for placing these organisms in a world that's law-like. For if there were no reason for the world to be regular in that way, God could prevent injury simply by causing the ground to become elastic when the squirrel falls from the tree. Or perhaps God could simply cause the flesh of organisms to instantaneously and miraculously regenerate upon injury. On the assumption that there are good reasons for creating living corporeal sentient organisms in such a law-like environment, God has good reason for permitting animals to feel pain. As long as there's not some other way of protecting their bodily integrity, which involves less pain and suffering, or perhaps none at all. I suspect most will be inclined to think that the case could easily be made that such protection could be afforded without any pain and suffering at all. After all, we can imagine designing robots which are capable of recognizing the presence of noxious environmental factors. And what's more, it seems as though God could have created organisms with a mechanism which suffice to signal the presence of noxious environmental stimuli without making the mechanism painful. Perhaps all we would need is something on the order of the internal equivalent of a fire alarm. Whistles and flashes go off in our head to let us know, danger, take action. No doubt we can imagine designing robots which are capable of recognizing dangers in the environment and responding so as to avoid them. But we're now assuming that the neo-Cartesian position is false. That is, we're assuming that it's a good thing for God to create corporeal sentient organisms. On the assumption that it's good for there to be such organisms, can those organisms survive? Uh, can those organisms succeed in surviving without some sort of mechanism which produces pain? Well, you might still think the answer is yes, for reasons that run along the following lines. The only reason that pain is adaptive is that it produces appropriate avoidance behaviors. Surely those behaviors could be made into some sort of reflex reaction. If God were to have made non-humans in this way, then even if they're sentient, it need not be the case that those adaptive behaviors we typically associate with pain are mediated by the sentient states of the organism. Even if animals aren't robots, it can still be true that some animal behaviors are exhibited without sentient states being involved. There are, however, other very good reasons why at least some pain behaviors couldn't successfully be rigged up to operate entirely in reflex fashion. Part of the reason for this is simply that the adaptiveness of pain behavior is often context dependent. Perhaps in some circumstances it's adaptive for me to pay heed to a noxious stimulus of a certain sort. If I step on a tack, it's appropriate for me to stop and pull it out of my foot before taking any more steps. But surely we wouldn't want this uh, sort of behavior hardwired in as a reflex. After all, if I'm being chased by a hungry grizzly and step on a tack, I better keep running. Hardwired pain-related behaviors would detract from flexibility, the sort of flexibility required to adapt to the complex environmental conditions that organisms encounter. Perhaps we should take this to show only that sometimes it's good to have pain behaviors mediated through sentient mental states of one sort or another. Still, this doesn't account for the fact that these pain states have to have the undesirable qualitative character that they have. Why that is, must pain hurt? We must imagine that the benefit, or we might imagine that the benefit is this. If pain didn't hurt, if pain states didn't hurt, they wouldn't serve to bring about such powerful or single-minded avoidance behaviors. But if that were true, we might chalk even that fact up to poor divine design. Perhaps God could have induced powerful and single-minded avoidance behaviors by making those behaviors immensely pleasurable. Or perhaps God could have made it the case that the mental states that accompanied noxious stimuli were cognitive in character, say, leading the animal to come to the belief, unless I act, I'm now in danger because of a serious injury to my foot. Interestingly, we have some good reason to think that these alternative mechanisms would not, after all, succeed. The evidence comes from the fact that re-engineering experiments have been done in human beings which have tried to deploy such strategies but without success. Paul Brand, the physician mentioned earlier, who worked with patients afflicted with Hansen's disease, attempted to mitigate the degenerative effects of the disease by designing gloves and socks which would be appropriately responsive to applications of excessive pressure. In this way, if a patient squeezed a piece of iron too hard or grabbed a thorny branch or stepped on a tack, the transducers on the apparatus would signal a potentially injurious stimulus. 
I'll quote the result of Brand's research here at some length. I don't know if this is on the handout or not. I can't uh, remember. Maybe it is. We have grandly talked of retaining the good parts of pain without the bad, which meant designing a warning system that wouldn't hurt. First, we tried a device like a hearing aid that would hum when the sensors were receiving normal pressures, buzz when they were, uh, when they were in slight danger, and emit a piercing sound when they perceived an actual danger. But when a patient with a damaged hand turned a screwdriver too hard, the loud warning signal went off, he would simply override it and turn the screwdriver anyway. Blinking lights failed for the same reason. Patients who perceived pain only in the abstract could not be persuaded to trust artificial sensors, or they became bored with the signals and ignored them. The sobering realization dawned on us that unless we built in a quality of compulsion, our substitute system would never work. These considerations give us some good reason for thinking that pain which isn't hurtful would fail to generate the necessary behavioral responses. But what of the objection that even if, as a matter of fact, sentient organisms don't respond appropriately to noxious stimuli which aren't hurtful, this is itself an avoidable defect in the creation? Why is it that sentient organisms aren't appropriately attentive to the other sorts of signs that bodily integrity is threatened. Why couldn't God make these organisms such that they respond appropriately to noxious stimulation, which wasn't painful? The problem with such a question is that it's not clear that we would know how to respond to such an objection, even if there were some perfectly good reason. For all we know, sentient states couldn't play the proper functional role unless those states were taken to be as strongly undesirable as we, in fact, take pain states to be. However, however we can say, uh, however, we can at least say at this juncture that nothing we accept forces us to say otherwise, and in light of this, these considerations supply us with, I think, a defensible CD for animal pain and suffering. At the close of the 19th century, few felt that convincing explanations for animal suffering had been given by Darwinian Christians. These sentiments are summed up well by the Spencerian John Fisk, who wrote as follows, a scheme which permits thousands of generations to live and die in wretchedness cannot be absolved from the charge of awkwardness or malevolence. It's impossible to call that being good who existing prior to the phenomenal universe and creating it out of the plenitude of infinite power and foreknowledge endowed it with such properties that its material and moral development must inevitably be attended by the misery of untold millions of sentient creatures of whose existence their creator is ultimately alone responsible. Perhaps after having heard this talk, you feel that we aren't much further along. I think there are a variety of explanations that the theist might latch onto when it comes to animal pain and suffering. Today I've presented only two. Whether or not you find either of these plausible, and hopefully you don't find both plausible because they're inconsistent, the issue deserves our sustained consideration. My hope is that these reflections will goad Christian thinkers off the sidelines and into the fray. Thanks.